dawn of history, new fear. The moon and stars were their only light. When the sky was dark, the blackness was absolute. But they dispelled the dark with fire, kindled by a spark from ironstone or from the friction of two pieces of wood. Fire was precious. It made a little hollow in the dark where a man could be warm and safe from the night beyond. Sometime in those shadowy days, far back beyond history, there must have lived a great inventor. He changed the whole life of man by making the first lamp. Most of the great inventions of primitive man, such as the hole, the potter's wheel, the millstone for grinding corn, most of these inventions persisted basically unchanged through the long, highly developed civilizations of Egypt, Babylon, and Greece, the ones we read about in the Bible and the classics. Even the most enduring of the ancient civilizations, the Roman, only altered the design and materials of the old Stone Age lamp. Let's jump forward in time. A thousand years have passed since that lamp was lit. Most of our ancestors were simple peasants, toiling from dawn till dark in the field. The great stone castles of the Norman kings and barons were only lit by baskets of flaming pine chips and an occasional candle. In the great new churches and cathedrals which were built in the centuries that followed, the glitter of candles at the shrines and chantries only accentuated the prevailing gloom. In their day-to-day -day life, our ancestors, rich and poor alike, were still ruled by the sun. was kept alight by monks who laboriously copied books by hand. Most of their activity was limited to the daylight hours, but if they worked after dusk, they would do so by the light of a beam. Candles were made, as they had been first in Roman days, by repeated dipping or pouring the hot wax over a wick till they were built up to the right thickness. Humbler people used rush lights made from mutton or pork fat on a wick of peeled and dried rush. Even as life grew more civilized, the cottager lived much as he had always done, and as he continued to do up to within living memory. Some 400 years ago, the modern age began. The houses of the rich ceased to be warlike and became homes of culture living, creative arts, and of comfort and luxury. By the 18th century, 200 years ago, houses could be comparatively well lit. But although among the wealthy, magnificent chandeliers were lit up for grand occasions, often you would still find only a single candle, even in quite good homes. If there was no fire, it had to be lit with all the ritual of the tinderbox. Strike a spark with flint and steel. Blow up the dry tinder into a flame. Light a sulfur match from it, and then light the candle. The whole house 
household would gather together in the evenings to read or work by this solitary light. Outside, in the turmoil of the streets, not much was done to help the wayfarer. There was next to no street lighting as we know it. You carried a lantern, or perhaps hired one of the ragged urchins, link boys, who carried torches or links before their customers. A flickering candle in a dark alley gave little enough light. Forces were already at work, which were to change all this. The steam engine and new industries based on it altered the whole way in which people lived. of the Industrial Revolution needed artificial lighting on a far bigger scale than could be provided by any of the old methods. In the 1700s, lighting depended upon burning solids or liquids. It was a daily task to fill the lamps or to put in fresh candles. And the old lamps were far from being the clean and efficient thing that an oil lamp is now. But soon after 1800, gas for lighting began to be made by heating coal in a closed container. This gas could be stored under pressure, led through pipes to where it was wanted, and was there ready to be lit whenever needed. By the 1860s, it had altered the whole character of street lighting. <laughs> provided the first really cheap and universal method of efficient lighting. The discovery of the American oil fields about this time made paraffin plentiful and put a clean and effective oil lamp within the reach of everyone. Not only the fuel, but also the design of oil lamps was improved so that they burned far more brightly. It isn't easy for us to realize what a difference this made in the simple household, especially in the country where gas was not available. For the first time, people there were able to have reasonably well-lit rooms. But already, men like Faraday and Davy were experimenting with electric light. In 1858, one of the first practical arc lamps was put to work. It was installed in the South Foreland Lighthouse, and it produced a sensation at the time. In the years that followed, machines were built to supply electric arc lighting in theaters, factories, and streets. Considered a wonder of the age, the arc was too big, too bright, 
and too much trouble for private homes. Then, in 1878, came the carbon filament lamp. It seems simple enough to us now, but it took the genius of Swan in England and Edison in the United States to create it. It was simple and cheap, where the arc was complex. It gave a soft light and needed no maintenance. great age of competition. Inventions in one sphere spurred on its rivals to do better. At the turn of the 20th century, acetylene, naphtha, paraffin, gas, and electricity were providing new lighting methods unimagined a century before. The night became bright. Meanwhile, Francis Hawksby's experiments of 1709 had received little notice. This is the book he wrote about his work with a picture of his apparatus. One of the machines which he used for producing sparks and other electrical effects was a glass globe which he rubbed while it was turning. For certain experiments, he pumped out most of the air from the globe. When he did this, he found that the inside of the globe was filled with a luminous glow, which came to be known as the electrical discharge. He says that the light so produced was sufficient to read words in capital letters by. As time went on, more was discovered about these electrical discharges, and an elaborate glass apparatus was made to demonstrate the different effects obtained with different gases. Let us be clear, this was something quite different from the ordinary methods of producing light. The electric current caused the gas to glow with less of the unwanted heat. It is light of this kind which shines from our present day neon sun. The modern fluorescent lamp is based on a type of discharge too, but the light is produced, so to speak, at second hand by the action of rays from the discharge on a powder with which the inside of the tube is coated. We don't realize how much of our life depends upon artificial lighting. We've come to take it for granted that we can work or amuse ourselves after dark just as easily as we can in the day, and have forgotten that this is something comparatively new in the history of mankind, for whom until quite recently the night was always dark out of doors, and only dimly and laboriously lit within. Great advances have been made in lighting methods in the last 10 years or so. Further inventions are probably already on the way. It's still the same night sky as it always was, but below, the world has changed. Now, wherever men live together in civilized communities, there is the glow of light in the night, a sign of shelter and security from the darkness.